Part One of Story Nine of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The White Poodle, Part One. One. By narrow mountain paths from one villa to another, a small wandering troop made their way along the southern shore of the Crimea. Ahead commonly ran the white poodle, Arto, with his long red tongue hanging out from one side of his mouth. The poodle was shorn to look like a lion. At crossroads he would stop, wag his tail, and look back questioningly. He seemed to obtain some sort of sign, known to him alone, and without waiting for the troop to catch up, he would bound forward on the right track, shaking his shaggy ears, never making a mistake. Following the dog came the twelve-year-old Sergei, carrying under his left arm a little mattress for his acrobatic exercises, and holding in his right hand a narrow dirty cage, with a goldfinch taught to pull out from a case various coloured papers on which were printed predictions of coming fortune. Last of all came the oldest member of the troop, grandfather Martin Lodishkin, with a barrel-organ on his bent back. The organ was an old one, very hoarse, and suffering from a cough. It had undergone, in the century of its existence, some scores of mendings. It played two things, a melancholy German waltz of Launer, and a gallop from A Trip to Chinatown, both in fashion thirty to forty years ago, but now forgotten by all. Beyond these drawbacks, it must be said that the organ had two false tubes, one of them, a treble, was absolutely mute, did not play, and therefore, when its turn came, the whole harmony would, as it were, stutter, go lame and stumble. The other tube, giving forth a bass note, had something the matter with the valve, which would not shut, and having once been played, it would not altogether stop, but rolled onward on the same bass note, deafening and confusing the other sounds, till suddenly, at its own caprice, it would stop. Grandfather himself acknowledged the deficiencies of his instrument, and might sometimes be heard to remark jocosely, though with a tinge of secret grief, "'What's to be done? An ancient organ! It has a cold! When you play it, the gentry take offence. Tfu! they say. What a wretched thing! And these pieces were very good in their time, and fashionable, but people nowadays by no means adore good music. Give them the geisha, under the double-headed eagle, please, or the waltz from the cellar of birds. Of course, these tubes... I took the organ to the shop, but they wouldn't undertake to mend it. It needs new tubes, said they, but, best of all, if you'll take our advice, sell the rusty thing to a museum, as a sort of curio. Well, well, that's enough. She's fed us till now, Sergey and me, and if God grant, she will go on feeding us. Grandfather Martin Lodishkin loved his organ, as it is only possible to love something living, near, something actually akin, if it may be so expressed. Having lived with his organ for many years of a trying vagabond life, he had at last come to see in it something inspired come to feel as if it were almost a conscious being. It would happen sometimes at night, when they were lying on the floor of some dirty inn, that the barrel-organ, placed beside the old man's pillow, would suddenly give vent to a faint note, a sad melancholy quavering note, like an old man's sigh. And Lodishkin would put out his hand to its carved wooden side, and whisper caressingly, "'What is it, brother? Complaining, eh?' have patience friend and as much as lodishkin loved his organ and perhaps even a little more he loved the other two companions of his wanderings arto the poodle and little sergey he had hired the boy five years before from a bad character a widower cobbler promising to pay him two roubles a month shortly afterwards the cobbler had died and sergey remained with grandfather bound to him for ever by their common life and the little daily interests of the troop. 2. The path went along a high cliff over the sea, and wandered through the shade of ancient olive-trees. 
The sea gleamed between the trunks now and then, and seemed at times to stand like a calm and mighty wall on the horizon. Its colour was the more blue, the more intense, because of the contrast seen through the trellis work of silver verdant leaves. In the grass, amongst the kizil shrubs, wild roses and vines, and even on the branches of the trees, swarmed the grasshoppers, and the air itself trembled from the monotonously sounding and unceasing murmur of their legs and wing cases. The day turned out to be a sultry one, there was no wind, and the hot earth burnt the soles of the feet. Sergey, going as usual ahead of grandfather, stopped, and waited for the old man to catch up to him. "'What is it, Serozha? asked the organ-grinder. "'The heat, grandfather Lodishkin. There's no bearing it. To bathe would be good.' The old man wiped his perspiring face with his sleeve, and hitched the organ to a more comfortable position on his back. "'What would be better?' he sighed, looking eagerly downward to the cool blueness of the sea. "'Only after bathing one gets more hungry, you know. A village doctor once said to me, "'Salt has more effect on man than anything else. That means it weakens him. Sea salt.' "'He lied, perhaps,' remarked Sergey doubtfully. "'Lied! What next? Why should he lie? A solid man, non-drinker, having a little house in Sevastopol. What's more, there's no getting down to the sea here. Wait a bit, we'll get to Mishkor, and there rinse our sinful bodies. It's fine to bathe before dinner, and afterwards to sleep, we three, and a splendid bit of work." Arto, hearing conversation behind him, turned and ran back, his soft blue eyes, half shut from the heat, looked up appealingly, and his hanging tongue trembled from quick breathing. "'What is it, brother doggy? Warm, eh?' asked Grandfather. The dog yawned, straining his jaws, and curling his tongue into a little tube, shook all his body, and whimpered. "'Yes, yes, little brother, but it can't be helped,' continued Lodishkin. "'It is written, in the sweat of thy face, though, as a matter of fact, it can hardly be said that you have a face, nor anything more than a muzzle. Be off! Go off with you! As for me, Serozha, I must confess I just like this heat. Only the organ's a bit of a nuisance, and if there were no work to do, I'd just lie down somewhere in the grass in the shade, and have a good morning of it. For old bones, this sunshine is the finest thing in the world." The footpath turned downward to a great highway, broad and hard and blindingly white. At the point where the troop stepped on to it commenced an ancient baronial estate, in the abundant verdure of which were beautiful villas, flower-beds, orangeries, and fountains. Lodishkin knew the district well, and called at each of the villas every year, one after another, during the vine-harvesting season, when the whole Crimea is filled with rich, fashionable, and pleasure-loving visitors. The bright magnificence of southern nature did not touch the old man, but it enraptured Sergei, who was there for the first time. The magnolias, with their hard and shiny leaves, shiny as if lacquered or varnished, with their large white blossoms, each almost as big as a dinner-plate, the summer-houses of interwoven vines hanging with heavy clusters of fruit, the enormous century-old plane-trees, with their bright trunks and mighty crowns, tobacco plantations, rivulets, waterfalls, and everywhere, in flower-beds, gardens, on the walls of the villas, bright sweet-scented roses, all these things impressed unceasingly the naive soul of the boy. He expressed his admiration of the scene, pulling the old man's sleeve, and crying out every minute, "'Grandfather Lodishkin! But, Grandfather, just look! Goldfish in the fountain! I swear, Grandfather, goldfish, if I die for it, cried the boy, pressing his face to a railing, and staring at a large tank in the middle of a garden. I say, grandfather, look at the peaches! Good gracious, what a lot there are! Look how many! And all on one tree! Leave go, leave go, little stupid! What are you stretching your mouth about? joked the old man. Just wait till we get to the town of Novorossiysk, 
and give ourselves to the south now that's a place indeed there you'll see something sochi adler twapse and then little brother sukum batum your eyes'll drop out of your head palms for instance absolutely astonishing the trunks all shaggy like felt and each leaf so large that we could hide ourselves in one you don't mean it cried sergey joyfully wait a bit and you'll see for yourself is there little of anything there now oranges for instance or let us say lemons you've seen them no doubt in the shops well well you see them simply as if they were growing in the air without anything just on the tree as up here you see an apple or a pear and the people down there little brother are altogether out of the way turks persians different sorts of Cherkesses, and all in gowns and with daggers a desperate sort of people and little brother there are even ethiopians i've seen them many times in batum ethiopians i know those with horns cried sergey confidently well horns i suppose they have not said grandfather that's nonsense but they're black as a pair of boots and shine even thick red ugly lips great white eyes and hair as curly as the back of a black sheep oh oh how terrible are ethiopians like that well well don't be frightened of course at first before you're accustomed it's alarming but when you see that other people aren't afraid you pick up courage there's all sorts there little brother when we get there you'll see only one thing is bad the fever all around lie marshes rottenness then there is such terrible heat the people who live there find it all right but it's bad for newcomers however we've done enough tongue-wagging you and i sergey so just climb over that stile and go up to the house there are some really fine people living there if ever there's anything you want to know just ask me i know all but the day turned out to be a very unsuccessful one for them at one place the servants drove them away almost before they were seen even from a distance by the mistress at another the organ had hardly made its melancholy beginning in front of the balcony when they were waved away in disgust at a third they were told that the master and mistress had not yet arrived at two villas they were indeed paid for their show but very little still grandfather never turned his nose up even at the smallest amounts coming out at the gate on to the road he would smile good-naturedly and say two plus five total seven hey hey brother serozhenka that's money seven times seven and you've pretty well got a shilling and that would be a good meal and a night's lodging in our pockets and perhaps old man lodishkin might be allowed a little glass on account of his weakness ay ay there's a sort of people i can't make out too stingy to give sixpence yet ashamed to put in a penny and so they surlily order you off better to give were it only three farthings i wouldn't take offence i'm nobody why take offence generally speaking lodishkin was of a modest order and even when he was hounded out of a place he would not complain however on this day of which we are writing he was as it happened disturbed out of his usual equanimity by one of the people of these crimean villas a lady of a very kind appearance the owner of a beautiful country house surrounded by a wonderful flower garden she listened attentively to the music watched sergey's somersaults and arto's tricks even more attentively asked the little boy's age what was his name where he learned gymnastics how grandfather had come by him what his father had done for a living and so on and had then bidden them wait and had gone indoors apparently to fetch them something ten minutes passed a quarter of an hour and she did not appear but the longer she stayed the greater became the vague hopes of the troop grandfather even whispered to sergey shielding his mouth with his palm the while eh sergey this is good isn't it ask me if you want to know anything now we're going to get some old clothes or perhaps a pair of boots a sure thing at last the lady came out on her balcony again and flung into sergey's held-out hat 
a small silver coin, and then she went in again. The coin turned out to be an old worn-out threepenny bit with a hole in it. No use to buy anything with. Grandfather held it in his hand and considered it a long while distrustfully. He left the house and went back to the road, and all the while he still held the bit of money in his open and extended palm, as if weighing it as he went. "'Well, well, that's smart,' said he at last, stopping suddenly. "'I must say. And didn't we three blockheads do our best? It'd have been better if she'd given us a button. That, at least, we could have sewn on somewhere. What's the use of this bit of rubbish? The lady, no doubt, thought that it would be all the same as a good coin to me. I'd pass it off on someone at night. No, no, you're deeply mistaken, my lady. Old man Lodishkin is not going to descend so low. Yes, milady, there goes your precious three-penny bit. There. And with indignation and pride he flung the coin onto the road, and it gently jingled and was lost in the dust. So the morning passed, and the old man and the boy, having passed all the villas on the cliff, prepared to go down to the sea. There remained but one last estate on the way. This was on the left-hand side. The house itself was not visible, the wall being high, and over the wall loomed a fine array of dusty cypresses. Only through the wide cast-iron gate, whose fantastical design gave it the appearance of lace, was it possible to get a glimpse of the lovely lawn. Thence one peered upon fresh green grass, flower-beds, and in the background a winding pergola of vines. In the middle of the lawn stood a gardener watering the roses. He put a finger to the pipe in his hand, and caused the water in the fountain to leap in the sun, glittering in the myriads of little sparkles and flashes. Grandfather was going past, but looking through the gate he stopped in doubt. "'Wait a bit, Sergei,' said he. "'Surely there are no folk here. There's a strange thing. Often as I've come along this road I've never seen a soul here before. Oh, well, brother Sergei, get ready.' A notice was fixed on the wall. Friendship Villa. Trespassers will be prosecuted. And Sergei read this all aloud. Friendship? questioned Grandfather, who himself could not read. Vo, vo, that's one of the finest of words, friendship. All day we've failed, but this house will make up for it. I smell it with my nose, as if I were a hunting dog. Now, Arto, come here, old fellow. Walk up bravely, Sarozha. Keep your eye on me, and if you want to know anything, just ask me. I know all. 3. The paths were made of a well-rolled yellow gravel, crunching under the feet, and at the sides were borders of large rose-coloured shells. In the flower-beds, above a carpet of various-coloured grasses, grew rare plants with brilliant blossoms and sweet perfume. Crystal water rose and splashed continually from the fountains, and garlands of beautiful creeping plants hung downward from beautiful vases suspended in mid-air from wires stretched between the trees. On marble pillars, just outside the house, stood two splendid spheres of mirror-glass, and the wandering troop coming up to them saw themselves reflected feet upwards in an amusing twisted and elongated picture. In front of the balcony was a wide, much-trampled platform. On this Sergei spread his little mattress, and Grandfather, having fixed the organ on its stick, prepared to turn the handle. But just as he was in the act of doing this, a most unexpected and strange sight suddenly attracted his attention. A boy of nine or ten rushed suddenly out of the house on to the terrace like a bomb, giving forth piercing shrieks. He was in a sailor-suit, with bare arms and legs. His fair curls hung in a tangle on his shoulders. Away he rushed, and after him came six people. Two women in aprons, a stout old lackey, without moustache or beard, but with grey side-whiskers, wearing a frock-coat, a lean, carroty-haired, red-nosed girl in a blue-checked dress a young, sickly-looking, but very beautiful lady in a blue dressing-jacket, trimmed with lace, and, last of all, a stout, bald gentleman, in a suit of two-sore silk, and with gold spectacles. 
They were all very excited, waving their arms, spoke loudly, and even jostled one another. You could see all at once that the cause of all their anxiety was the boy in the sailor suit, who had so suddenly rushed on to the terrace. And the boy, the cause of all this hurly-burly, did not cease screaming for one second, but threw himself down on his stomach, turned quickly over on to his back, and began to kick out with his legs on all sides. The little crowd of grown-ups fussed around him. The old lackey in the frock-coat pressed his hands to his starched shirt-front and begged and implored the boy to be quiet, his long side-whiskers trembling as he spoke. "'Little father, master, Nikolai Apollonovitch, do not vex your little mamma. Do get up, sir, be so good, so kind, take a little, sir. The mixture's sweet as sweet just syrup, sir. Now let me help you up.' The women in the aprons clapped their hands and chirped quickly, quickly in seemingly passionate and frightened voices. The red-nosed girl made tragic gestures, and cried out something evidently very touching, but completely incomprehensible, as it was in a foreign language. The gentleman, in the gold spectacles, made speeches to the boy in a reasoning bass voice, wagged his head to and fro as he spoke, and slowly waved his hands up and down. And the beautiful, delicate-looking lady moaned wearily, pressing a lace handkerchief to her eyes. Ah, Trilly, ah, God in heaven, angel mine, I beseech you, listen, your own mother begs you. Now do, do take the medicine, take it and you'll see, you'll feel better at once, and the stomach ache will go away, and the headache. Now do it for me, my joy, oh, Trilly, if you want it, your mamma will go down on her knees. See, darling, I'm on my knees before you. If you wish it, I'll give you gold, a sovereign, two sovereigns, five sovereigns. Truly, would you like a live ass? Would you like a live horse? Oh, for goodness sake, say something to him, doctor. Pay attention, Truly. Be a man, droned the stout gentleman in the spectacles. ay 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 yelled the boy, squirming on the ground, and kicking about desperately with his feet. Despite his extreme agitation, he managed to give several kicks to the people around him, and they, for their part, got out of his way sufficiently cleverly. Sergei looked upon the scene with curiosity and astonishment, and at last nudged the old man in the side, and said, "'Grandfather Lodishkin, what's the matter with him? Can't they give him a beating?' "'A beating? I like that. That sort isn't beaten, but beats everybody else.' a crazy boy, ill, I expect. Insane? inquired Sergei. How should I know? Tss, be quiet. ay ay scum, fatheads! shouted the boy, louder and louder. Well, begin, Sergei, now's the time, for I know, ordered Ludishkin suddenly, taking hold of the handle of his organ, and turning it with resolution. The snuffling and false notes of the ancient gallop rose in the garden. All the people stopped suddenly and looked round. Even the boy became silent for a few seconds. "'Ah, God in heaven, they will upset my poor Trilly still more!' cried the lady in the blue dressing-jacket, with tears in her eyes. "'Chase them off quickly, quickly! Drive them away, and the dirty dog with them! Dogs have always such dreadful diseases! Why do you stand there helpless, Ivan, as if you were turned to stone?" She shook her handkerchief wearily in the direction of grandfather and the little boy. The lean, red-nosed girl made dreadful eyes. Someone gave a threatening whisper. The lackey in the dress-coat ran swiftly from the balcony on his tiptoes, and, with an expression of horror on his face, cried to the organ-grinder, spreading out his arms like wings as he spoke. Whatever does it mean? Who permitted them? Who let them through? March! Clear out!" The organ became silent in a melancholy whimper. "'Fine, gentlemen, allow us to explain,' began the old man delicately. "'No explanations whatever! March!' roared the lackey in a hoarse, angry whisper. His whole fat face turned purple. 
and his eyes protruded to such a degree that they looked as if they would suddenly roll out and run away like wheels. The sight was so dreadful that Grandfather involuntarily took two steps backward. "'Put the things up, Sergei,' said he, hurriedly jolting the organ on to his back. "'Come on!' But they had not succeeded in taking more than ten steps when the child began to shriek even worse than ever. "'Ay, ya, ya! Give it me! I want it! Ay, give it! Call them back! Me!' "'But Trilly! Ah, God in heaven, Trilly! Ah, call them back!' moaned the nervous lady. Tfu! How stupid you all are! Ivan, don't you hear when you're told? Go at once and call those beggars back. Certainly. You, hey, what do you call yourselves? Organ grinders, come back, cried several voices at once. The stout lackey jumped across the lawn, his side whiskers waving in the wind, and overtaking the artistes, cried out, Psst, musicians, back. Don't you hear, friends? You're called back cried he, panting and waving both arms. "'Venerable old man,' said he at last, catching hold of grandfather's coat by the sleeve, "'turn the shafts round. The master and mistress will be pleased to see your pantomime.' "'Well, well, business at last,' sighed grandfather, turning his head round. And the little party went back to the balcony where the people were collected and the old man fixed up his organ on the stick and played the hideous gallop from the very point at which it had been interrupted. The rumpus had died down. The lady with her little boy and the gentleman in the gold spectacles came forward. The others remained respectfully behind. Out of the depths of the shrubbery came the gardener in his apron and stood at a little distance. From somewhere or other the yard-porter made his appearance and stood behind the gardener. He was an immense bearded peasant with a gloomy face, narrow brows, and pockmarked cheeks. He was clad in a new rose-coloured blouse, on which was a pattern of large black spots. Under cover of the hoarse music of the gallop, Sergei spread his little mattress, pulled off his canvas breeches they had been cut out of an old sack, and behind, at the broadest part, were ornamented by a quadrilateral trademark of a factory, threw from his body his torn shirt, and stood erect in his cotton underclothes. In spite of the many mends of these garments, he was a pretty figure of a boy, lithe and strong. He had a little programme of acrobatic tricks which he had learnt by watching his elders in the arena of the circus. Running to the mattress, he would put both hands to his lips, and, with a passionate gesture, wave two theatrical kisses to the audience. So his performance began. Grandfather turned the handle of the organ without ceasing, and while the boy juggled various objects in the air, the old music machine gave forth its trembling, coughing tunes. Sergei's repertoire was not a large one, but he did it well and with enthusiasm. He threw up into the air an empty beer-bottle, so that it revolved several times in its flight, and, suddenly catching it neck downward on the edge of a tray, he balanced it there for several seconds. He juggled four balls and two candles, catching the latter simultaneously in two candlesticks. He played with a fan, a wooden cigar and an umbrella, throwing them to and fro in the air, and at last, having the open umbrella in his hand, shielding his head, the cigar in his mouth, and the fan coquettishly waving in his other hand. Then he turned several somersaults on the mattress, did the frog, tied himself into an American knot, walked on his hands, and, having exhausted his little programme, sent once more two kisses to the public, and, panting from the exercise, ran to Grandfather to take his place at the organ. Now was Arto's turn. This the dog perfectly well knew, and he had for some time been prancing round in excitement and barking nervously. Perhaps the clever poodle wished to say that, in his opinion, it was unreasonable to go through acrobatic performances when Ray Amour showed thirty-two degrees in the shade. But Grandfather Lodishkin, with a cunning grin, pulled out of his coat-tail pocket a slender kizil switch. Arto's eyes took a melancholy expression. "'Didn't I know it?' they seemed to say and he lazily and insubmissively raised himself on his hind paws, 
never once ceasing to look at his master and blink. "'Sir, Varto! So, so, so!' ordered the old man, holding the switch over the poodle's head. "'Over! So! Turn! Again! Again! Dance, doggy! Dance! Sit! What? Don't want to? Sit when you're told! Ah, that's right!' "'Now look! Salute the respected public! Now, Arto!' cried Lodishkin threateningly. Vaff! barked the dog in disgust. Then he followed his master mournfully with his eyes, and added twice more, "'Garf! Garf!' "'No, my old man doesn't understand me,' this discontented barking seemed to say. "'That's it, that's better. Politeness before everything. Now we'll have a little jump,' continued the old man, holding out the twig at a short distance above the ground. "'Allez! There's nothing to hang out your tongue about, brother. Allez! Gop! Splendid! And now, please, noch einmal, allez, gop, allez, gop, wonderful doggy. When you get home you shall have carrots. You don't like carrots, eh? Ah, I'd completely forgotten. Then take my silk topper and ask the folk. Perhaps they'll give you something a little more tasty. Grandfather raised the dog on his hind legs, and put in his mouth the old greasy cap, which, with such delicate irony, he had named a silk topper. Arto, standing affectedly on his grey hind legs, and holding the cap in his teeth, came up to the terrace. In the hands of the delicate lady there appeared a small mother-of-pearl purse. All those around her smiled sympathetically. "'What? Didn't I tell you?' asked the old man of Sergei, teasingly. "'Ask me if you ever want to know anything, brother, for I know nothing less than a rouble.' At that moment there broke out such an inhuman yowl that Arto involuntarily dropped the cap and leaped off with his tail between his legs, looking over his shoulders fearfully, and came and lay down at his master's feet. "'I want him!' cried the curly-headed boy, stamping his feet. Give him to me! I want him! The dog, I tell you! Treely wants the dog! Ah, God in heaven! Ah, Nikolai Apollonovitch! Little father, master, be calm, Treely, I beseech you! cried the voices of the people. The dog! Give me the dog! I want him! Scum! Demons! Fatheads! cried the boy, fairly out of his mind. But, angel mine, don't upset your nerves! lisped the lady in the blue dressing-jacket. "'You'd like to stroke the doggy? Very well, very well, my joy. In a minute you shall. Doctor, what do you think? Might Trilly stroke this dog?' "'Generally speaking, I should not advise it,' said the doctor, waving his hands. "'But if we had some reliable disinfectant, as, for instance, boracic acid or a weak solution of carbolic, then generally—' "'The dog!' In a minute, my charmer, in a minute. So, doctor, you order that we wash the dog with boracic acid, and then? Oh, Trilly, don't get into such a state. Old man, bring up your dog, will you, if you please? Don't be afraid. You will be paid for it. And, listen a moment, is the dog ill? I wish to ask, is the dog suffering from hydrophobia or skin disease? Don't want to stroke him. Don't want to, roared Trilly blowing out his mouth like a bladder. "'Fatheads! Demons! Give it to me altogether! I want to play with it, for always!' "'Listen, old man, come here!' cried the lady, trying to outshout the child. "'Ah, Trilly, you'll kill your own mother if you make such a noise. Why ever did they let these music people in? Come nearer, nearer still, come when you're told. That's better.' Oh, don't take offence. Treely, your mother will do all that you ask. I beseech you, miss, do try and calm the child. Doctor, I pray you. How much do you want, old man? Grandfather removed his cap, and his face took on a respectfully piteous expression. As much as your kindness will think fit, my lady, your excellency. We are people in a small way, and anything is a blessing for us. Probably you will not do anything to offend an old man. Ah, how senseless! Treely, don't make your little throat ache. Don't you grasp the fact that the dog is yours and not mine? Now, how much do you say? 
Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Ah, I want it! Give me the dog! Give me the dog! squealed the boy, kicking the round stomach of the lackey who happened to be near. Th that is, forgive me, your serenity, stuttered Ladishkin. You see, I'm an old man, stupid. It's difficult to understand at once. What's more, I'm a bit deaf. So I ought to ask, in short, what were you wishing to say? For the dog? Ah, God in heaven, it seems to me you're playing the idiot on purpose, said the lady, boiling over. Nurse, give Trilly some water at once. I ask you, in the Russian language, for how much do you wish to sell your dog? Do you understand? Your dog! Dog! The dog! The dog! cried the boy, louder than ever. Ludishkin took offence, and put his hat on again. Dogs, my lady, I do not sell, said he coldly and with dignity. And what is more, madam, this dog, it ought to be understood, has been for us too, he pointed with his middle finger over his shoulder at Sergey, has been for us too, feeder and clother. It has fed us, given us drink, and clothed us. I could not think of anything more impossible than, for example, that we should sell it. Trilly all the while was giving forth piercing shrieks like the whistle of a steam engine. They gave him a glass of water, but he splashed it furiously all over the face of his governess. "'Listen, you crazy old man, there are no things which are not for sale, if only a large enough price be offered,' insisted the lady, pressing her palms to her temples. "'Miss, wipe your face quickly and give me my headache mixture. Now, perhaps your dog costs a hundred roubles. What then? Two hundred? Three hundred? Now answer, image. Doctor, for the love of the Lord, do say something to him.' "'Pack up, Sergei growled Lodishkin morosely. Image! Image! Here, Arto! Hey, wait a minute, if you please, drawled the stout gentleman in the gold spectacles in an authoritative bass. You'd better not be obstinate, dear man. Now I'm telling you, for your dog, ten roubles would be a beautiful price, and even for you into the bargain. Just consider, ass, how much the lady is offering you. I most humbly thank you, sir mumbled Rodishkin, hitching his organ on to his shoulders. Only I can't see how such a piece of business could ever be done as, for instance, to sell. Now I should think you'd better seek some other dog somewhere else. So good day to you. Now, Sergei, go ahead. And have you got a passport? roared the doctor in a rage. I know you, Canale. Porter, Semyon, drive them out! cried the lady, her face distorted with rage. The gloomy-looking porter in the rose-coloured blouse rushed threateningly towards the artistes. A great hubbub arose on the terrace. Trilly, roaring for all he was worth, his mother sobbing, the nurse chattering volubly to her assistant, the doctor booming like an angry cockchafer. But grandfather and Sergei had no time to look back or to see how all would end. The poodle running in front of them, they got quickly to the gates, and after them came the yard-porter, punching the old man in the back, beating on his organ, and crying out, "'Out you get, you rascals! Thank God you're not hanging by your neck, you old scoundrel! Remember, next time you come here, we shan't stand on ceremony with you, but lug you at once to the police station! Charlatans!' For a long time the boy and the old man walked along silently together, but suddenly, as if they had arranged the time beforehand, they both looked at one another and laughed. Sergei simply burst into laughter, and then Lodishkin smiled, seemingly in some confusion. "'Eh, hey, Grandfather Lodishkin, you know everything?' teased Sergei. "'Yes, brother, we've been nicely fooled, haven't we?' said the old organ-grinder, nodding his head. A nasty bit of a boy, however. How they'll bring up such a creature the Lord only knows. Yes, if you please, twenty-five men and women standing around him, dancing dances for his sake. Well, if he'd been in my power, I'd have taught him a lesson. Give me the dog, says he. What then? If he asks for the moon out of the sky, give him that also, I suppose. Come here, Arto, come here, my little doggy-doggy. Well, and what money we've taken to-day! 
Astonishing! Better than money, continued Sergey. One lady gave us clothes, another a whole rouble. And doesn't Grandfather Lodishkin know everything in advance? You be quiet, growled the old man good-naturedly. Don't you remember how you ran from the porter? I thought I should never catch you up. A serious man, that porter. Leaving the villas, the wandering troop stepped downward by a steep and winding path to the sea. At this point the mountains, retiring from the shore, left a beautiful level beach covered with tiny pebbles, which lisped and chattered as the waves turned them over. Two hundred yards out to sea, dolphins turning somersaults, showing for moments their curved and glimmering backs. Away on the horizon of the wide blue sea, standing as it were on a lovely velvet ribbon of dark purple, were the sails of fishing boats, tinted to a rose colour by the sunlight. "'Here we shall bathe, Grandfather Lodishkin,' said Sergey decisively, and he took off his trousers as he walked, jumping from one leg to the other to do so. "'Let me help you to take off the organ.' He swiftly undressed, smacking his sunburnt body with the palms of his hands, ran down to the waves, took a handful of foam to throw over his shoulders, and jumped into the sea. Grandfather undressed without hurry. Shielding his eyes from the sun with his hands, and wrinkling his brows, he looked at Sergey and grinned knowingly. "'He's not bad. The boy is growing,' thought Lodishkin to himself. "'Plenty of bones, all his ribs showing but all the same he'll be a strong fellow. "'Hey, Saroshka, don't you get going too far? A sea-pig'll drag you off!' "'If so, I'll catch it by the tail!' cried Sergey from a distance. Grandfather stood a long time in the sunshine, feeling himself under his armpits. He went down to the water very cautiously, and before going right in, carefully wetted his bald red crown and the sunken sides of his body. He was yellow, wizened, and feeble, his feet were astonishingly thin, and his back, with sharp protruding shoulder-blades, was humped by the long carrying of the organ. "'Look, Grandfather Lodishkin!' cried Sergey, and he turned a somersault in the water. Grandfather, who had now gone into the water up to his middle, sat down with a murmur of pleasure, and cried out to Sergey, "'Now don't you play about, piggy! Mind what I tell you, or I'll give it to you!' Arto barked unceasingly, and jumped about the shore. He was very much upset to see the boy swimming out so far. "'What's the use of showing off one's bravery?' worried the poodle. "'Isn't there the earth, and isn't that good enough to go on? And much calmer?' He went into the water two or three times himself, and lapped the waves with his tongue. But he didn't like the salt water, and was afraid of the little waves rolling over the pebbles towards him. He jumped back to dry sand, and at once set himself to bark at Sergey. "'Why these silly, silly tricks? Why not come and sit down on the beach by the side of the old man? Dear, dear, what a lot of anxiety that boy does give us!' "'Hey, Sarozha, time to come out, anyway. You've had enough!' cried the old man. "'In a minute, Grandfather Lodishkin!' the boy cried back. "'Just look how I do the steamboat! Oh, At last he swam into the shore, but before dressing he caught Arto in his arms, and returning with him to the water's edge, flung him as far as he could. The dog at once swam back, leaving above the surface of the water his nostrils and floating ears alone, and snorting loudly and offendedly. Reaching dry sand, he shook his whole body violently, and clouds of water flew on the old man and on Sergey. "'Sirozha, boy, look, surely that's for us!' said Lodishkin suddenly, staring upwards towards the cliff. Along the downward path they saw that same gloomy-looking yard porter in the rose-coloured blouse with the speckled pattern, waving his arms and crying out to them, though they could not make out what he was saying, the same fellow who, a quarter of an hour ago, had driven the vagabond troop from the villa. "'What does he want?' asked Grandfather, mistrustfully. End of Part One